questions, Amy? Yeah, 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 yeah Sorry, for sure. Uh, just wanted to follow up on that just real quick. If you go to PowerToChoose.org, yeah. you, know, yeah. you mentioned the three, yeah. um, you know, the three uh, plans that pay back for solar, um, and you go to renewable power, this is actually like where you can find the quotes. Uh, no, no, no. Uh, yeah, yeah, so go to Power to Choose, and it'll show you everybody that's in our deregulated market. Yeah, and then obviously you enter your zip code. Yeah, Okay, so it shows, and these, so these, these are the companies, and you, know, you can click on them, obviously, and, um, and look, there's Reliant. <laughs> but the, the these way, are the other companies. By the way, interesting, you can put almost any zip code in the state, and you'll get those same results. Same results? Oh, even in, okay, I see, even so, in regulated so okay. right, Yes. Questions? Uh, would you, uh, still charge uh, a lot of these fees that like Encore charges and whatever on the bill? Yes, Encore is going to charge you the same fees no matter what company you're with, which is $5 a month and I think it's about 3 cents a kilowatt. And it doesn't matter which REP you pick, they're going to charge you those same rates. With the Screen Mountain, TXU, Reliant, or the dozens of other people, they, uh, Encore's fees are getting the juice from the source to you. So that's the lines, the transformers, and the substations. So all the power lines and everything you see, that's what our is charging you for, is the energy from the producer to the consumer. With solar, that amount goes down because you're producing power on site, so there's not power having to be transmitted to you from the source, so you're only charged for what you actually pull from the grid. Yeah, we're heavy users. Most the average house pulls about 1,500 kilowatts in North Texas. We pull about 6,000. But they're only charging 1500 which is nighttime usage, and the rest we produce ourselves, and we still shoot another 2,500 kilowatts to my neighbors. Yes, No, it's brand new. Um, this, in, I have nothing against either gentleman. I love all the stuff. I go research it. But in my case, in-phase seems like it's the better option. Why do I want to get rid of my lead acid batteries? Because it is a hazard. There's sulfur gas that comes out, it's still dangerous. That's why you're supposed to put them outside or in a garage, not in your house. These lithium ion are very safe. They're worry free. They produce 10 years plus. It's a better system. So I want to switch to that, but it wasn't available five years ago. This is all brand new. So these uh, you know, power walls coming out. Uh, he's installed next week. So yeah. that's, that's great. We're going to have him here in Dallas, which is awesome. The Sony, we've got a guy with Plano. These are all brand new technologies. So, you know, whoever you like, go, go support. Go support them. How yes. many kilowatt hours of batteries do you have in your system now? This is a tech question you'd ask Dan or Jim or one of the experts. But I can tell you, when I did the research, one bank of batteries was not enough for me to go three days without sun. Now, with what I have in my garage and the two outside banks, we could have zero sun, and that's going to provide my critical loads for three days. And if I have sun, it's going to recharge. Yes. When you go with an AC coupled system and the grid is down, what happens when your batteries are fully charged? What happens to the extra power from your panels? That is an excellent question. I should have mentioned that. Magnum has something inside there that uh, when you do AC coupling, you have to monitor your batteries, you have to charge your batteries, and you have to have a management system because your, your solar panel is going to give you as much juice as possible. Well, if your batteries are fully charged, that juice has to go somewhere. If you don't have a, a, di a diversion load set up, then what Magnum is going to do is it's going to change the hertz cycle, which shuts off your solar. It's going to go from 60 hertz to 59 hertz. So your, your, anything that's plugged in can still run, but your solar panel is going to shut off, which prevents you from charging your batteries. Which, if you have a lot of load, that may cause a problem for your inverters that's running from your from your battery. I'm not the I'm not the uh, the guy that does everything, but the way they explained it, there's, there's no way you're going to fry your batteries, and there's no way it can go and hurt your load. So somehow it manages everything from your solar panels to your batteries to what your load needs and monitors the grid. But I can't give you the where how. I can tell you how. Okay. It works just like your car does. You have an alternator in your car that charges your battery. When your battery is full, that alternator cuts back and just applies your load to your car. The house does the same thing. He runs basically off of his batteries. As long as the batteries are full, the regulator for the solar panels only puts so much power into the batteries. 
when the load is increased, the regulator turns on, provides more power. So the, even though the panels are still producing, they're not producing as much, and they're keeping your batteries at a steady, steady level, just like your alternator does in your car with the voltage regulator. Yeah, it's not a dumb system. It's, 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 it's smart. I don't know. If, it's it's kind of like if you disconnect the battery from your car, that battery still has power in it, but it doesn't have to go anywhere. A solar panel is the same way. If you disconnect it, it's not going to hurt it. Well, something's got to control the the frequency on the inverters. From from my understanding, it is if you lose the load or you don't have enough load and you're still producing full power, you've got to still control the the frequency on the bus. And the way the frequency is controlled. Um, is by charging the batteries. It's just the, the load to the batteries when it's cans, but when they're full, uh, you said Magnum has a diversion. It's all included in there. It has a diverter yeah. that it has to in, engage. Then the inverter itself controls the frequency, okay, and it's constant. It's not like a power station where it depends on an RPM or something to maintain frequency. Yeah, you're the inverter, from the grid. Yeah. When it takes over, it's already switched over and it's an independent micro grid. You're, you're completely disconnected from the grid. So the inverter controls the frequency no matter what the load is, uh, unless the load exceeds what the inverter can put out. And the charger for the, for the solar panels going to the batteries, what regulates the voltage to the batteries to maintain a constant voltage. Uh, I'm off grid and I have two inverters and the inverters are coupled together and they put out constant 60 cycle no matter what my load is in the house. And if the batteries are full and I don't have a big load on, the charger regulates the voltage coming out or the current coming out of the panels to make sure my batteries do not get overcharged. If I turn on a heavy load, all of a sudden the voltage tries to drop on the battery and the, and the charger sees that, it starts turning the solar panels on heavier to maintain that voltage on the batteries. Every solar panel has an in-base micro inverter. Those, I think the micro inverter will not actually convert power unless they see the grid connected to AC. Right. So I have to see the 60 hertz from the grid or wherever right. in order to. That's why you use either Schneider, Brosius, uh, Magnum, or Outback can provide that perfect 60 hertz, perfect 240 volts. So the in-phase micro inverters think the grid is still there. And, and they will keep producing. It creates a grid looking system, a micro grid. So the batteries, when the, when the grid goes down, the transfer switch happens in milliseconds and it immediately provides a perfect 240 volts, perfect 60 hertz cycle. So the solar panels think the grid is still up. If we don't have any other questions, I guess we can go through the typical questions for Tesla, uh, for the Tesla Powerwall. Uh, can we can we ask him questions or is he yeah. Oh, yeah, of course, yeah. yeah. Okay, I thought Jay was getting the turn. No. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I, I just cut off earlier. I wanted to make sure Jay. Yeah, got yeah, yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. I definitely understand that. Okay, I have I have an Okay. Honda makes a device that will allow you to do an emergency charge from your car, or emergency power from your car to your house, but not one for daily use, but just has it for emergency. What I would like to do is do it for daily use and then have either have a Tesla um, Roadster or a zero motorcycle so I have a battery at the house all the time to run it. Since you're a real retailer, I was wondering if you We've come across this. Tim's been actually working with a couple of, of our customers who are trying to figure out you know, how can I most optimize my Tesla charging. And I mean, Tim may be able to speak to this or, or, or stand better than I, but you know, you still need to go through the inverter to, to charge these, right? So there's, there's not this like DC, straight DC to DC um, on a lot of the charging that I think everybody would really like to see. Um, and, and that's part of you know, the individual products coming out and not necessarily all you know, wanting to do everything we wanted to do right off the bat. Um, I don't know if there are any other. 
that we've gotten uh, around batteries, say, for the last 10 years are, you know, can it solve my problem or my use? And I think you're, like, you did it all yourself and you, very specific solution evolved over time. And I think we're, we're moving, and I think Tesla's probably sort of the best example to say, let's invert the question from what is, um, what we want it to do exactly, like, let's cobble it together and figure out how to put things together that weren't designed to go together to say let's let's try to establish a more robust common platform um, and in this case it's really higher voltage battery banks um, and see how we bring all those parts together <coughs> and so the communications is a big uh, big issue we found even on the Tesla um, they have to speak the same language and so that's already like we're in the world of Babel you know we have been and, and now on the, the voltage side like there is a there's a voltage the batteries like to be um, at, and the like, big utility scale is a whole other, uh, you know, animal. And I think we're seeing those things evolve from what's my specific question, how do I solve it, you know, and then throw your hands up and say, well, nothing works, to let's keep pushing on the use case um, so that that common platform can be more, more robust. And I think we looked at Tesla's roadmap, Inface's roadmap, Sonnen's roadmap, like they've sort of already imagined you know, an entire DC environment that can speak interchangeably together, but it's, they're working in the limitations of markets. And you know, where do the markets work? Germany was great. Um, so we got a lift off, and now it's the high electricity markets in the, in the US. And they're just kind of like it's bandwidth issue, is from what I can tell. Um, and I think this market has a lot of different use cases that uh, seem approachable but we're challenging sort of their technological roadmap, I would say, right now. I know it's not a direct answer, but I think it's, I think you bring something up that probably represents a lot of different, um, you know, pushing pushing on boundaries, and they're, they're great pushes. And the Shines, I think, is trying to address that, too. They're, they're really, their challenge is how to get everybody together to talk at the same time. It's, it's challenging. Question. I was excited when Tesla started coming out with the, with the Powerwall battery. However, there's a lot of systems out there, grid or off-grid, yep. that use 48 volts because there, there, there are so many inverters out there. Now, I was disappointed to find out that the Tesla battery will not work with a 48 volt system. Is there any plan for Tesla to do something like that to where they can integrate with the 48 volt system in the future? From, from what we've seen, there's a lot of things that are out on the roadmap uh, as far as not just um, different voltages, <coughs> but uh, compatible with different inverter systems, whether it's SMA or Fronius. Um, right now, the Solar Edge is, is uh, the, the only kind of inverter system that's compatible with the Powerwall. So as we're looking to folks that have um, other systems, it basically involves a retrofit, where we'd swap out the inverter and, and bring in the battery as well. I think it's important to note it's kind of the same issue. Solar Edge. Had an arc, has an architecture, and it's sort of the hybrid, you know, micro-inverted slash central inverter, but they, they're operating at a voltage that um, is compatible with the target voltage of Tesla for other reasons, and probably for similar electromagnetic reasons, but it's, um, they were the first, it was like an expedient way to get to market. I think Tesla has in their Skunk Works a much, a much more integrated package, um, 
but at this point they're you know solar edge massive you know global market share and so it was a it was a, it's a good piggyback right now I, I just figured since there's literally thousands and thousands of 48 volt systems out there that, i mean like sony is doing it with their with their system i was hoping they tested would do something like that yeah I, you know i think that i think it's a it's a choice and Sony said we can we can interoperate easily with everyone all the time. And Tesla said, let's go for a platform. Um, and the inverter manufacturer is actually moving that way. Fronius is coming up with something that's, it'll be comparable. So I think we're seeing the industry, and both will serve, you know, the <coughs> markets differently. I had a question. On one of those slides, the Powerball said, <laughs> We're not lining up. Where's Amy? She's supposed to line these people. It was, it was three kilowatt of power. Is that the draw that you can pull off that battery when when it's battery only? So right. my question is, if your load is more than three, what happens? Uh, so if the uh, we asked this question to Tesla, I mean, it's a, it feels like a limitation. Um, uh, you know, big AC, it's not going to it's not going to handle it. You know multi-ton unit obviously um, if it's if it draws more there's a, there's a breaker internally that would would shut it down but it's basically to protect the so the, if it's grid tied we just say we got to pull the extra from the grid but if it shuts off yeah grid tied you see no there's no issue it's a it's, it's a com common bus yeah okay. yeah yeah no no problem and then if you put two together do you get seven so they're working on you know expanding and it's an it's a uh, energy plus energy, or energy plus power, or power plus power, and that's that's mostly in the firmware. So it's really the inverter uh, communications that is the bottleneck, mm -hmm. and they're you know it's again the kind of bandwidth issue. So they said so. Tesla uh, or uh, I should say Elon is like a master of you know the future roadmap. And I think since then they've narrowed down what they what they offer to the market. So I signed up last year for Google Powerballs. Haven't heard anything about it, but I'm assuming that two questions here. One, to the Powerball battery, is that a lifetime warranty by Tesla, like the batteries on a Tesla? And then two, do you have to keep the batteries cool? Because, you, you know, they're saying put it in your garage. Well, in the summertime, the garage is 130, 140 degrees, no air movement when the door is closed. So if you have to, you know, shoot some HVAC out there, keep the garage cool, keep the battery cool for the highest performance. Then the next question, third question, is that the way you tie these power walls together, when I, when I have my seven ton unit on in my house, and then I want to supercharge my Tesla, I'm drawing how much, and will the batteries handle it? How many my need? So, three questions. I'll take a shot at that. I think the first one was, why isn't somebody called me back? I'm sorry about that. Yes. <laughs> um, so, uh, and I think there was some confusion as to whether you're supposed to put it through Tesla or through us, but um, I'll come talk to you after this. Sounds good. No problem. Um, and sorry about that. Uh, the second question was with respect to temperature. Temperature, great, temperature. great. Max temp, 122 degrees Fahrenheit. So as we all know, most of our garages are unconditioned, and man, it can get hot in there, right? Particularly if your garage is on a certain portion of your is the side of your house. So um, if it's if you have an unconditioned garage, as most of us do, and it gets hot in there. You either have to condition that garage or the, the battery needs to go outside. And it needs to go outside on the north side of the house where it's not going to get direct sun. That's the answer. Okay. Yeah. Third question? Third question is, I don't think you're going to be able to run your AC <laughs> and charge your Tesla at the same time. <laughs> so, 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 you know, if you have a 60 kilowatt Tesla, right, and a 6 kilowatt battery, it, it's kind of obvious that it's not going to charge the whole thing. And it really depends on priorities, right? With respect to, particularly if it's in backup mode, what loads do you want to put onto that battery or series of batteries if you're somebody that really, hey, I want to max this thing out and be able to add to it over time? Yeah, you can continue to add. And really, it's just about kind of priorities and budget 
what what gets assigned to be uh, on that on that battery uh, exclusive? What loads get get on the list? And is the Powerwall battery a lifetime guarantee? Oh, sorry, yeah, like ten, ten, 10 years. Ten years. Ten years on uh, on the product and on the installation. There's one Thank other you. thing that can be done about the temperature inside the garage. Instead of conditioning the whole garage, you put a small enclosure yeah, around the battery box and just condition the battery box. Yep. Consume a lot less energy. Make a little mechanical room right. also works. Yep. And it's it's liquid cooled, Tesla, and that's probably one of the unique things. It's it's like the car. It's hermetically sealed, so it's a unit. Um, the sauna, just by comparison, a little lower thresholds, 95 degrees, because it's an assembly of, of parts. And so that's that's one of the things there. You know, Tesla's sort of targeting how to keep that, you know, the, the batteries safe. Um, and honestly, we've worked closely with Austin Energy. It's not a straightforward proposition, even though so Tesla makes it sound like it from a fire perspective. Um, they don't use the word fire. It's a runaway thermal event. <laughs> but it's um, but there's a kind of educational gap or just a, a, a curve um, with some of the agent J's. There's really really no threat. It's just something that to your question about temperature, that's the sensitivity. So they, they put a lot of energy in the okay. management. Thank you. Uh, sure. Oh, sorry, let's go in the front of here. Yeah, I'm sorry, I made one person. Do you know Tesla going to have its own panels after the acquisition of the So uh, I can't really speak to what Tesla's going to do strategically, but obviously if they if they integrate with Solar City, then they'll have panels and, and you know a whole um, uh, PV system as well as the battery all. I think we have time for one more question. So, at what point um, is the Tesla your backup battery? Your car? Which which sets of, they've talked about it because it's two way already and two way that battery. Um, but at what point? Because if I've got a 80 kilo, kilowatt battery and I need 10 at night, well, it's sitting in my garage. So I'm plugging it in. The line can go either way. Question number one and number two is. Um, these demand batteries or these battery storage in the houses can also be called upon through the grid to dump during excessive demand for the whole environment. The in, in environment. When I was back up in a different state, they would dumb down our appliances if it was too much. Well, they could also request these to pull the battery back up and give you a rebate. Give you a rebate yeah. because you're helping the system and they don't got to turn on another coal fired plant. Yeah, and you know, it sounds like we're getting kind of close to that because I mean, I can turn on all my systems from my phone right now. Right. How hard is it for you know this to come together? It seems like we're not that far away from it. Well, I'm going to take a stab at it, um, and I think it's a great segue for this this group. Um, the things you mentioned are not technically uh, unfeasible. I think your you know, the comment about NEC like that has to migrate. So just plugging in another load, the grid sees. Your, your car as a load potentially, even though it's you're, you're thinking it's speeding. So they, that's an interconnection, and so that that that's, uh, has to meet certain guidelines. So what that looks like working both ways, it may not be a technical but a, a policy and code code driven question. I think your second question is even even more profound. That um, you know, like Vermont right now bought 500. Tesla power walls and they're doing just that. Like you know, they've got a demand management program. They're paying people to either you know subsidizing a, a lease for or paying a you know for, for the demand use of it. And and that gets to the question you brought up about you know we were really cheap power here. Um, but the, the the point about Encore like it's that little fee that uh, it sort of sticks there. It's low, but you know in the like middle of Dallas, middle of Houston. The congestion fees, so the, the impact on the grid, um, that's creeping up and up and up. And it's, it's, it's not tied to natural gas, it's just literally the traffic cops. And so the batteries, um, I think there's some language at the PUC now looking at aggregating the storage resources. So that has to be written, it didn't exist before. Um, and then it would allow distributed storage you know, units to operate in, in uh, together 
And then there'd be a policy or a rate structure on top of that that would allow some sort of compensation. So I think that those are questions I think that you know a group like this can drive really specifically. And it, you have to keep pushing because it's and it's not really Tesla's purview to make that happen for us or Sonnen or Infix or the rest. Well, and, and I think I think two things. I think you're really keying on. Yet we're getting close to it to a. Uh, a time where there's technology in place where the utilities can build services around, right? And so that's, I think that's our hope in particularly up here in this region where, where the utilities do get a bit more creative and how they're incentivizing and, and who knows uh, what, what is, are their financial drivers, whether it's you know, signing you up as a long-term customer or having you advocate to all these people to go with Reliant and there's value in that, right? Even though they may not be be, be making money right, right on each individual transaction. So one is, the, the hope is that utilities, whether it's in a deregulated market like this, or even in Austin, where they're doing the Shines program, we're gonna be supplying the batteries for that. And, and Austin Energy is gonna get a lot smarter. We, you know, they're pretty tight around how they handle things, but they're gonna get a lot smarter and experiment with some things. I also think from a technology perspective, you ask, hey, when can I just push that, uh, that power for my car uh, back into my home? And I think, uh, like we've seen with Tesla with their vehicles, um, they're opening up functionality with, with the, these vehicles already on the road through over-the-air updates. It's fully our expectation that the functionality that's available today is just kind of the baseline beginning. If you think about this like the first iPhone, that all it had was you know, an iPod, a, uh, you know, a Safari browser, and a phone, right? And then six months later, their apps. and, and texting and all that and it just grows. So to Stan's point about this really being a platform that uh, both utility services and then additional functionality from the manufacturer can be opened up. I think this is just really the beginning. Um, and so, you know, and folks that either uh, were looking for more information on Powerwall or they just had questions about specific use cases, uh, please uh, talk to Tim, talk to Stan, talk to myself afterwards. We're happy just to give uh, free advice, yeah, this will work for you, or no, it won't. Um, just happy to be connected and be invited up here, so thanks. Mm -hmm. okay, so thank you to everyone. Um, Graham, I'm Jay. Yeah, quick announcement, the Solar Tour Committee um, is going to be meeting uh, at, what time is it now? Uh, 12, how about 12.15? Okay. At 12.15 um, to talk about the Solar Tour. I'm oh, sorry, Dan, did you no, have No, no, I was just going to add something. I realize a lot of you folks don't know me. I kind of remain behind the scenes a lot. I'm actually also a member of what is called the EPRI Smart Grid Development Committee nationwide. EPRI is the Electric Power Research Institute. We're trying at this point to answer your question with regard to when can I actually back feed you know, from my home into the utility grid. We are at this time, and for the last 10 years, we've been trying to take 19th century technology from the original power grid and move it into the 21st century. That's a little more work than you might realize. Let me just simply keep it very short and say, what you want to do with batteries in your home and allowing the utility company to command your system into overdrive for a short period of time when they need peaking power and then have them pay you for it, that's in development right now. Great. Yay. Okay, so they're available for questions. <laughs> I speak for it, yes. Okay. Thank you.